Well, welcome and thank you for joining us for this interview. Uh, for the month of October, First Church is uh, working th our way through a book called Holy Love by Dr. Steve Harper uh, and engaging a conversation about what it means to be an affirming church and fully welcoming of LGBTQ plus persons and, and all people uh, who we want to affirm as made in the image and likeness of God and having sacred worth. Uh, we hope that uh, this interview supplements uh, the, the reading and discussion of that book and uh, adds to your understanding uh, and, um, and perhaps is also a bit enlightening for you. Uh, so I welcome tonight uh, my two guests, uh, both who are friends of First Church, no strangers to us, uh, Megan Siepel uh, and Carrie Lee. Uh, thank you both for, for being with me for a bit uh, to, to talk tonight. So um, maybe I could ask you both to, to introduce yourselves and share a little bit uh, about who you are uh, and your connection to First Church. Um, Carrie, would you mind going first? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm Carrie Lee. I grew up in First United Methodist Church of Orlando um, as an active member of the youth group and going on mission trips. Um, I was a uh, consistent camper at the Warren W. Willis United Methodist Youth Camp um, and then worked there for two years, uh, two summers um, after I graduated from high school and started college. Um, I went to college at Northwestern University um, in Chicago area and got degrees in computer science and voice performance um, and then moved after college to Seattle um, where I've been living with my husband for the last eight years. Um, working as a software engineer and also um, singing on the side. Very good, thank you. Megan. Okay, um, I'm Megan Siepel, my pronouns are she and her. Um, I also grew up at First Church, um, was baptized there, went to Sunday school all the way through to youth group, um, sang in the, the youth choirs, the children's choirs and youth choirs, played in youth handbells, and then was part of the original uh, Wesley Ringers when that was started. Um, went to Wednesday night suppers, MYF, so um, very much, you know, that first church was a major part of, of my childhood. Um, after high school, went to University of Central Florida, so continued going to church at First Church. Um, and then, uh, in fact, met my wife there playing volleyball um, during the singles volleyball nights that, that we would have on uh, Thursday nights. Um, got married uh, and moved out to Colorado for a while. Um, lived there for 15 years, kind of bounced around from a, a few churches. Um, never really found anything that quite felt like home, like First Church does, and um, ended up back here uh, a few years ago, and um, kind of took our time a little bit, and we're uh, re-engaging, well, we were re-engaging until the pandemic hit, and so we're all kind of stuck at home like everyone else, um, and doing what we can at home. That's good. So, uh, so both of you shared some things that I hope you'll elaborate on. Uh, Carrie, you mentioned your husband. Uh, Megan, you mentioned your wife uh, and your, your uh, pronouns, uh, mm -hmm. she and her. Uh, so when we were talking about identity, I uh, wonder if you could just elaborate for us, share more about that and, and, and your journey uh, of sort of self-awareness, self-discovery. Okay. Um, well, for me, uh, my journey was largely about gender. Um, when I was born, uh, the doctor said, it's a boy. Uh, he was wrong. Um, everybody uh, treated me that way. And I, growing up, um, I just felt different. And there were a few times that I tried to speak up and, and vocalize what was different. And was told at those points, no, you're a boy, and learned, okay, that's, that's my lot. That's, you know, half the people on this earth have to be boys, so I guess that's what I got. And, um, you know, grew up, um, you know, was always attracted to women, met, uh, met a beautiful woman, fell in love, uh, married, um, we have a daughter. Um, everything, really, uh, life was really, really good when you look at it from the outside. Um, we had everything that we needed and then some. Um, I had a great job, uh, still have a great job, um, 
we had, you know, all of everything that we needed, roof over our head, food to eat, um, money to be able to, to do things with. Um, but I was not happy. Um, and in fact, um, when I got into my 40s, started having insomnia, um, was not able to sleep, and I would be up at night, and I would just have my, my thoughts would be racing, my mind would be racing, and it would be thoughts of, I'm a woman. Why do I think I'm a woman? I'm, I've got a man's body, but I'm a woman, and just confusion and trying to figure that out, um, you know, researched it on the internet as best as I could, and would some nights would end up just thinking to myself okay that's it in the morning when when my wife wakes up i'm just going to tell her and and we'll be done with it we'll figure it out and finally would fall asleep and when i woke up i'd kind of go huh oh that was kind of silly i why would i think that and try to go back to life and and just live the way that i thought i was supposed to live and, um, and I don't think that the timing on this next part is coincidental at all. Um, about a month after my father passed away, I, the, the insomnia just kept getting worse. And the, the thoughts were just, the, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And I got to a point where the thoughts turned to, I am not worth anything. I'm not worthwhile. I am... I'm worth more to my family dead than alive. If I can find a way to end my life and make it look like an accident, I will have done them a service by dying because they will have gotten a payout from life insurance and, and other things. They will be set for life and I will have done something good for them. And that's how I can best serve my family is by dying mm. and that scared me and that night I started to write um, for the first time I let these thoughts out of my head started to write and about 6 30 in the morning finally exhausted went to sleep and then uh, the next day when I got up I looked over what I had read and was like Oh boy, it's still true. Hmm. And that that evening came out to my wife and told her what was going on and expected her to, to immediately pack up our daughter and run and go find an, a divorce lawyer. Um, and to her credit and my undying gratitude, she didn't. She stayed and she she was scared with me, but she took care of me and she told me we're going to figure this out and we have um we still have a lot to figure out and some of it might not end up being things that can be resolved but we that was five years ago and we're still together and we've been married over 25 years and uh vance actually married us <laughs> all those years ago um and I, the, the thoughts that I finally had to deal with when I came out to myself five years ago were my gender is not right. What I, I'm not a man. I am a woman. Or at least partly a woman. And I had to figure that out. And it's been five years of journey ever since figuring out what does gender mean to me and how do I fit into the gender spectrum. And it took a while, but I finally... I finally figured it out enough that I now I, I know that I am a trans woman. Um, I know that I'm still in love and attracted to my wife. So as far as sexuality goes, it's kind of a mess because I thought I was straight when we got married. Um, but turns out I'm a woman. So does that make me a lesbian? Does what does that make for my wife? Is she now a lesbian? Because She's very adamant that, nope, she's straight. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the sexuality part of it is, is a real mess to figure out. Um, but we're working on it, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to something that can work for, for all of us in, in our family. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Carrie? 
Sure. Um, I identify as a, a gay cisgender man. Um, I uh, came out uh, in the first couple years that I was in college. Um, in high school, I dated girls um, somewhat unsuccessfully. I wasn't happy doing so. Um, um, went off to my first summer at, uh, working at camp. Um, had a girlfriend when I left for camp um, and uh, broke up with her by the end of the summer and started dating uh, my now husband, Todd, who I met um, working at Warren Willis camp hmm. um, in our first summer. Uh, and then we started dating uh, long distance the first year um, when I was in college. Well, he was, he's also from Florida, from Jacksonville, um, finishing his AA um, in Jacksonville. And then he transferred to DePaul for a four-year degree in theater. Um, and we, uh, so we were together in Chicago for four years. Um, and for much of that, the beginning of that time, um, nobody knew that we were dating. Um, uh, in my first year of college, I started coming out to some of my close friends in school. Um, and then winter break of my first year of college, I came out to my mom. Um, that didn't go very well. Um, and then the next year or so, um, slowly came out to the rest of my family. Um, by the end of that time, uh, things were starting to improve. Um, when I first came out to my uh, best friend in college, freshman year, um, there were advertisements, um, flyers around the campus for a gay Bible study um, at the University Christian Ministry, which was a um, joint campus ministry between uh, the United Methodist Church, the PCUSA, um, and uh, Lutheran Church ELCA, I think. Um, or maybe it was the UCC. Actually, I think it was UCC instead. Um, and my, uh, my friend Nathan offered to go with me to that. Um, and we started attending. Um, and uh, University Christian Ministry wound up being a, a big part of my um, college experience and also led to my um, experiences with my greater experiences with the United Methodist Church and with LGBT activism in the United Methodist Church. Hmm. Um, it was through that that I um, became involved in the United Methodist Student Movement, which led to my involvement in Reconciling Ministries Network. Um, uh, so that it's all kind of been intertwined for me for a long time. Um, and now uh, I live in Seattle. Like I said, I'm a member at the First United Methodist Church of Seattle, um, where Todd and I got married five years ago. Um, after we were married, uh, the love letter to the church was written, um, signed by a whole bunch of um, LGBTQ pastors mm -hmm. um, in the United Methodist Church, many of whom had not previously uh, been out publicly. That included the pastor who married us. Um, so uh, the United Methodist Church and my coming out process and my um, identity as a gay man have always been very intertwined. Mm. Well, let, let me segue that question um, to both of you. Um, so I'm curious about your time at First Orlando, and um, you, you both were involved in, well, every aspect of, of church ministry as you're growing up, I know, and youth group. And I, I just wondered, um, you know, as you think back about First Church as, as a, the environment that you were growing up in and as you were, you know, beginning to wrestle with your own sense of, of who you were and uh, who you were expected to be. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you have any memories of First Church that stand out to you and um, how, how you were supported or, or not um, toward, toward your own self-discovery? Um, when I, I've thought a lot about this, um, and when I was growing up at First United Methodist Church of Orlando, um, we didn't talk about homosexuality. Um, that, as far as a Florida United Methodist Church went, was pretty good, actually, mm -hmm. um, because it meant that we weren't actively doing harm. Um, and I, I, I think if I had been at a church that were doing more talking and more negatively, I, I don't think I would be Christian today. Um, I do remember many missed opportunities to be inclusive or welcoming. Um, for example, I, I remember when I was in ninth or 10th grade, um, did a weekend sort of sex ed program that was a joint curriculum with the Presbyterian Church across the street. Um, that curriculum was entirely heteronormative. 
Um, so it didn't really leave the possibility that anybody in that entire group might not be straight. Um, I also remember anonymously asking about homosexuality in, in that um, forum. Um, and the response was um, fairly honest, as in kind of an I don't know um, answer at a time when um, a positive affirming answer would have been really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of what I mean by like not actively doing harm um, as in not preaching hellfire and brimstone or anti-gay messages. Um, one positive thing I remember is um, having a couple of visible gay couples in the church. I know um, there's a couple in my parents' Sunday school class. Um, it wasn't something people talked about, but, um, but they were there and you could see them. Um, and and that, uh, that I think was probably the most positive piece. Um, I also do remember, um, uh, in particular, one person in youth group being um, pretty heavily bullied for being presumed to be gay. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I remember a couple of people in either youth group or Sunday school who were out as gay. Um, and it was in, this is, I think, fairly typical of that time period that the kids that were actually out as gay got by a lot better than the kids who were presumed to be gay. Mm. Um, I think I personally was not the target of much of that, largely because this other person got the brunt of it. Um, and uh, and that, that shouldn't be something that would have protected me, but I think it, it did to some degree. Hmm. Um, so largely I'd say that uh, the church had avoided doing the worst of the harm, um, provided some opportunities uh, for a lot of theological exploration. I definitely was raised with um, a good United Methodist value of doing my own theology um, and not being told dogmatically what was right or wrong. Um, but uh, I, I came out of, um, of high school believing that, uh, that figuring out whether um, homosexuality was sinful or not was, um, was something that gay people needed to do and it was nobody else's business. Mm -hmm. um, and I think ultimately for that time period, that was as as good as I was going to get coming out of Central Florida. Mm. Megan, how about you? Well, I I do have a few specific memories. Um, uh, one of the things that I've discovered in uh, therapy and in my uh, self examination is that uh, the way that I coped with my gender. Um, was that I learned to deny, uh, I was in denial, and that turned into suppression and then even repression and depersonalization. So I've found that I've got a lot of gaps in my uh, memories of my youth um, because I would bottle things up and bury them really deep, but um, with some help I've unearthed a few things. And in fact, the earliest memory that I have uh, from growing up, and I was maybe two or three years old, um, I was in the church nursery um, over in the, the Ledbetter building uh, during one of the church services. And I was playing uh, with a girl and we were doing great. We were having a good time. And then all of a sudden she just stopped. And she's like, we can't play together. You're a boy and I'm a girl and girls and boys don't play together. And my response was, no, I'm a girl. What are you talking about? And she's like, no, you're a boy. And I started to get upset. And before long, one of the adults that was working in the nursery noticed and came over. And I'm sure I was, uh, you know, a blubbering mess at that point. And, you know, she, she says that I'm a, I'm a boy and I'm not a boy. I'm a girl. And the adult is, you know, very well-meaning, uh, not intending anything. Um, except to just, you know, try to calm me down it was like, oh, no, you know, that's silly. You're a boy. And I remember in that moment thinking, but how do you know? You didn't ask me. And that, <laughs> there's a lot of emotion tied up in that, obviously. Um, later in church, um, you know, seeing the girls uh, interacting and doing things. And, you know, Sunday, we're, they're wearing pretty dresses. And I knew that that was for me, but I had nothing to go on to prove it. So 
I had to suck it up and be the best boy I could be in, the, in those times. And I even have a picture um, that uh, somebody posted on Facebook a few years ago of um, Sunday school class. It was in, it was in the youth group. And um, basically it's me and seven girls and boy, do I look uncomfortable because they're all there in their pretty dresses and I'm there not in a dress and knowing that that's what I'm supposed to be in. And yeah, that was, that, that was illuminating when I saw that picture. It, that brought back uh, some memories. But um, as, as far as experiences directly dealing with what I was going through, uh, I think I'm in the same uh, same boat as Carrie. Uh, things like this, just they weren't talked about, which in hindsight, I agree that probably was for that time about the best thing that could have happened. Because when I was growing up, the attitudes that would have come uh, had they been talked about it were very likely going to have been way more damaging than just not knowing. So from that perspective, that was, that was good. Um, it, it left a lot, of, a lot of questions on my side um, because I couldn't find any answers really anywhere. Um, and it's not that necessarily that the church was responsible for giving me those answers, but um, yeah, there, there were just no, no answers. And so I was left to figure it out on my own. Um, and yeah, I, looking back, my experiences with the church were good, um, especially youth group. Um, I came into the youth group at a time when Vicki Rourke was still there and she, we're, we're still in touch to this day um, and, and a group of us from the youth group are still in touch. And it was unique in that no matter what happened as youth, we knew we were loved no matter what we did, we knew we were loved. We knew that, yeah, there might be consequences for whatever we did, but it would be, those consequences would come with a measure of love attached to them. And there were no questions about that love. It was just, that's just what it was. And I don't think that it's, it's I don't think it's coincidental that a lot, there's a lot more people that emerged from that generation of the youth group that are part of the LGBTQ um, world than would be statistically predicted based upon population averages. Um, there was something special going on in that youth group at that time. And I'm glad that I got some of that. Um, and and my, you know, my, the end of my youth group experience, of course, was with you, Vance. Uh, you'd come in as the youth director. And it was just more of the same. It was you know, I, I, I'm sure that you were pulling your hair out sometimes with me, but I didn't, I didn't ha ever have a thought that this was going to cost me the love that you were showing me, that, that you, I knew you loved me. And thank you for that. That, that was such a blessing and such a gift. I'm, I'm glad you knew that, and it's true. Yeah. So, you know, I'm listening to both of you, and... I'm, I'm simultaneously thankful for the good that you received at First Church. And, and I think you're both being very gracious and saying, you know, it was probably the best that a Methodist church in Central Florida at that time had to offer. Um, and at the same time, you know, wishing, that, wishing we had done better, um, uh, both in my time as the youth director for you, Megan, but as a you know, just as the pastor of this church, uh, for both of you. And, and I'm thinking about words that we use sometimes like, like acceptance or, um, affirming or, um, or safe or, or what it means to be an ally. And it, it sounds like in many ways the the, the church managed, uh, even if, it, you know, even if, there were, you know, nobody talked about, you know, um, <laughs> things that we, we managed to be accepting. Um, but, but that, that maybe that's not enough. Um, and, and wonder if you could talk both of you about 
you know, what it would mean to be an affirming church and, you know, the, the affirmation that would have been meaningful to you then. And, you know, if, if there was a younger version of yourself in the youth group today, what you would hope um, First Church could offer them in terms of affirmation. But what does that look like? What does affirmation mean? What does it look like? Okay. Um, well, for me, um, it means that first and foremost, that I love God and that God loves me and that there are no asterisks, no conditions and no qualifications to either of those. There is nothing attached to my gender, my sexuality, my orientation that goes with that. Those are universal. Those are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. It means that I, that my being a woman is recognized as a fact. Uh, it is not, it's not questioned or challenged or debated. It's not, it's not something that is debatable. That's just, that is a reality of my existence. Um, and it means that my validity and value as a woman are, are appreciated. Um, and it means that who I'm attracted to, um, who I love, who I'm in consensual, adult, romantic, emotional, spiritual, sexual relationships with are, they're, they're celebrated as being positive, that they're healthy, that they're holy relationships. It, it means that who I am is celebrated without any, any reservation. Um, it means that I see and that I hear language that demonstrates that I'm appreciated for, for who I am. Mm. Uh, it means that I am welcome and that I am included anywhere that I would be if I were a straight cisgender woman. Mm. And it means that my relationships with others in the church are mutually nurturing that we trust, care, love, and have empathy for each other. Thank you. That was powerful. Yeah. I think, um, to me, accepting uh, leads to uh, things like um, being accept accepting of someone um, for who they are or possibly being accepting of someone despite who they are. Mm -hmm. um, rather than uh, affirming, which goes on to um, affirming someone f because of who they are and for who they are. Mm -hmm. So um, accept an accepting church is a church that uh, accepts anyone where they are and allows them to participate. An affirming church is a church that um, celebrates who people are um, for who they are and recognizes that the diversity of the different people coming in is a strength of the congregation. Mm. Um, one that recognizes that queer people and queer voices have something unique to bring um, and can help teach the rest of the church about the body of Christ. And that without them, we don't have a complete picture. Um, so an affirming church is one that recognizes not just that it's uh, LGBT people who need to be allowed in the church, but it's the church that needs LGBT people to be present. Mm. Yeah, they, that that last statement, you said a lot of powerful things there, Carrie, but particularly uh, that we don't just allow you in. Um, that that's what acceptance kind of communicates, isn't it? That we, we're, we'll allow you in and we'll tolerate you um, versus uh, that that's powerful, that the church needs you. Um, and, and, you know, we affirm that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing both of you were baptized at First Church in our sanctuary, and uh, when we, when the whoever that pastor was, when he took you in, he or she took you into their arms. Uh, you know, they were affirming your sacred worth, and uh, and we we didn't even know who you were at that point, but we already <laughs> could theologically claim that about you, and and certainly that hasn't certainly that hasn't changed um, that that we need the full diversity of God's children in the church. Yeah. That's, uh, thank you for that. And that, and, and I appreciate that the way you both talked about, a, you know, the, the words that were, I don't think either one of you said this, but that, you know, that affirming is, is like, you know, in marriage, we talk about love, honor, and cherish. Well, that, that's more than tolerance, right? That mm -hmm. that's, I, I see your value and um, I see what you bring 
to this relationship. Yeah, and you both certainly do. What, um, you know, so maybe even take it one step further. So, you know, one, you know, churches may think they're doing a good thing by being accepting. Um, and maybe that's not a bad place to start, uh, but hopefully become, uh, as, you know, as we're seeking to do at First Church to become an affirming church. Um, but maybe the word ally, what, what you, when you hear that word, what, what does it mean for a, somebody like me, uh, you know, uh, my pronouns are, are him and his, um, straight, cisgendered, you know, what does it mean for somebody like me to be an ally for you in the church and in the world? Well, for me, um, being an ally means that um, you are, well, affirmation definitely comes with it. It's, it's, it's not, being an ally is not something that is a performance. It's, it's something that you're living. Um, it's standing with queer people um, and, and amplifying our voices when we're talking about our experiences. And it's speaking for us when we aren't present or when we can't speak for ourselves. And it's, you know, it's, it's showing, it's showing us that you have our backs, that you, you've got us, you'll catch us if we fall, mm -hmm. that you'll tend to our wounds if we're hurt, um, and that you're going to love us regardless. And I mean, it's kind of the same things that everybody needs um, from, well, everybody, I, you know, that's what we're looking for we, in our relationships with others, with the people that we're married to, the people that we're friends with. It's show, show me that you are thinking about what it must be like to have a different experience. You don't need to, you don't need to understand it necessarily, but let me know that you're, you're trying, that you're thinking about it and that you recognize that things can impact me differently than they're going to impact you or impact somebody else. And it's, it, you know, just, you know, show up at, events that are important to me that that are validating my identity and you know don't talk over us um, when when we need to speak please just be there to amplify our voices and not to speak over us mm. um, but yeah it's 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 mainly be there love us show us that you're thinking about what we need and you're doing your best to provide for those needs wherever you can Excellent. Carrie, what would you add to that? Yeah, I think um, allyship is in part um, comes from someone who has power um, and means giving up some of that power in mm. order to lift someone else up. Mm. Um, one place that this comes into play uh, is, is in being able to hear queer voices um, and making us a part of the conversation. Um, the UMC has a particularly bad history about this, about talking about LGBTQ people as if we weren't there. Um, and the way to change that is, is not just to talk about us as if we're in the room, but make us one of the people speaking. Um, mm. And uh, one way to do that is to make sure that LGBTQ people are present on church council. Mm -hmm. um, and if there aren't, there are people in the congregation and nominations committee should be paying attention to um, different spectra of diversity when, when figuring out the leadership of the church. Um, so allyship is about intentionally lifting up the voices um, of the marginalized and other minorities. Mm, excellent. I mean, I, the word justice is coming to mind of um, advocating. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is, so I, I'm, I want to turn this over to you. Um, and uh, Carrie, you're on the other side of the country now, um, but still have family at First Church. Megan, you're, you're, you're home. But what, I, what do you want to say? Like, what, what haven't I asked? Um, what, uh, you know, kind of in the spirit of what you both said of, uh, you know, how, how can I just let this last moment be a chance to amplify what, what you want to say and uh, what, what you would like um, this, your church, this, this, this place that has been your church to hear from you about your life and your story. Well, um, I think 
one of the main takeaways that I would like for people to have is um, I'm human. I'm a person. I'm just like you in most ways. There are differences, yes, but they're not, you know, most of the things are similar. We, we have very similar experiences in so many different ways. So don't, don't look at me as some oddity or something weird, different, strange, whatever. Um, just recognize that, yeah, I'm a human and I've got experiences too. And sure, some of them are going to be a lot different than yours, but a lot of them are going to be similar to yours. And so let's build off of that. Let's, let's create relationships, you know, and if you have questions, ask them. If you have questions about my gender or about my, my orientation, go ahead, ask them. That, that's fine. Um, you know, please be respectful, you know, make sure that you're treating me with, with dignity and that you're respecting uh, mine and, and my family's privacy. Um, but I've found that the more people ask me questions, the more I learn about myself too. And that's so important to me because I've, I have purposefully throughout my life kept myself from knowing things about myself and I'm trying to undo that. So questions help, but also don't think that that's the only topic of conversation when it comes to me. Mm. I've got, I, I'm, I'm more than my gender. I am more than my orientation. I'm more than my sexuality. I, I have interests. I like technology. I like performing arts. I like Cirque du Soleil. Um, you know, let's, let's talk about those things too and bond over those things. Um, because that's, that's what I think we all need is to, to feel connected and together. And sure, I want you to learn about the things that make us different but I also want us to use the things that are, are the same to, to bring us together. Mm. Um, so um, the only other thing that I would say is um, that there's a lot of people in this church that knew me from before my transition. And I just want to say I'm, I'm mostly the same person. I mean, the outsides have changed a lot, but the person that I am on the inside is mostly the same. Um, I'm just a lot more comfortable in my body and I'm, I'm able to bring my whole self to the relationships that I'm building with people. And, and that's, that's nice. And I, I think that that is good for everyone that I can do that. But I, I want you to know, don't, please don't avoid talking about our past. It happened. And, and we were there, we experienced it. So sure. Let's, let's acknowledge that. Let's reminisce about these things. Let's, Let's talk about the funny things that happen. Let's talk about the things, you know, where, you know, one of us almost died and <laughs> it's amazing that we didn't and, you know, whatever, you know, um, these things happened. Don't, don't ignore them. Um, they're, they're fair game. Let's talk about them. But I do ask that you use my name. I'm Megan and use my pronouns. She, her, when describing me in the past, because regardless of what, Everyone thought what I, when, what it, what I look like in, in, you know, I even thought that I was a boy. I thought that I was a man. I wasn't. I was a woman the entire time. So those are the correct words to be using about me. So, but, you know, if we know each other well enough and you're a hugger, I'm a hugger. Let's hug. I mean, let's be real people with each other. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, Carrie, platform is yours. Yeah, um, I've, uh, so like I mentioned before, I've been involved um, in some LGBTQ activism and the United Methodist Church. I'm less involved than I used to be um, uh, going to First United Methodist Church of Seattle. Um, we've got a large queer presence and large queer leadership within the church. Um, and largely I'm looking forward and, uh, figuring out where we're going to be when, as the church changes. Um, but I've been involved in a lot of training and a lot of, um, aware a lot of, of how this process goes that First United Methodist Church of Orlando is going through. Um, I'm really proud of y'all for going through it. 
Um, but some things to keep in mind that I've heard about, um, not from Funko, but just in general about the process. Some questions people have is, um, do we really need to do this? Uh, and or we're already an affirming church. We already live into this. Why, why do we need to actually make this process? Mm -hmm. And the reason is that if I moved to Orlando today and weren't from there, um, if you didn't have an open, a, a welcome statement that explicitly listed LGBTQ people as welcome and were explicitly listed as an affirming church, I would never come. Um, that is a, a prerequisite for me attending a church. Um, and in today's era, if, if you don't, if you're not explicitly um, affirming, you're assumed to be um, unaffirming. Um, and that's, that is generally how LGBTQ Christians um, view a church. We, it's, it's with um, a lot of skepticism um, because a lot of people have been hurt. Um, I'd say also that uh, this, there's a lot of opportunity to um, open doors to LGBTQ people. Um, there's a lot of people who, there are a lot of people and I have friends who are um, atheist and, and hate church because of how they were harmed by it. But there's also a lot of people who are open to being invited back um, with the right spirit. Um, and that comes like with Megan said of an acknowledgement of the past, mm -hmm. um, uh, apologizing for and recognizing the harm that the church, not, not FUMCO, but the church capital C has done to LGBTQ people over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of opportunity for, um, for growth with an, an active, um, meaningful and dedicated um, uh, language with talking about um, how, what, what we're doing to change and grow and how we're going to be um, breaking away from the past. Um, so that's, that's part of what I would say there. Um, it's, it's a really important process. It's a really important um, decision to make and it is important to be explicit about it. Um, otherwise it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. Thank you both for this time. Uh, this, this has been uh, good for me. And um, I, I just, it's been generous of you to give this time and to share from your hearts and your life story. I'm thankful for that. Um, and and uh, as pastor of First Church, I just want to speak a word of affirmation to you, both of you, that uh, we're, we are proud of who you are. We're proud of who you've become. Um, and, and I think uh, proud that we got to be part of, of uh, your life and, uh, and uh, your growth toward the, the, the man and woman you are today. So... Uh, receive that as a blessing from your church. Know that know that uh, you are loved, and many will be blessed by this and appreciate um, what, what the wisdom that you were able to bring through your stories. So, thank you both. Thank you.